welcome to another adventure here on my channel. Today, I'm going to be taking a look at the internalized sexism of J.K. Rowling by analyzing the character of Lavender Brown. So if you enjoy this video, make sure to like and subscribe and do all that good youtube -y stuff. And with that, let's go ahead and dive in with why I feel the need to make this video. Because with J.K. Rowling very much showing that she is a TERF, which is a trans-exclusionary radical feminist, which if you're not sure what that means or you don't understand why it's harmful or you think that all she said was that biological sex is real, then I am going to include a link to an amazing video by an amazing YouTuber, Jessie Gender, down in the description that goes into what JK Rowling has said, why it's harmful, why the TERF movement is very harmful and is not feminist, it's just transphobic. She really explained everything so much better than I could, so I'm gonna direct you to that video if you are not sure or would like to learn more from an amazing creator here on this platform. But part of the argument that comes with the worldview of being a TERF is the feminist part. The term is trans exclusionary radical feminist for a reason. And the ideal they preach is that somehow by hurting trans people, they are lifting up women and they are empowering women and being good feminists by keeping trans people down. But I would argue that genuinely trans exclusionary radical feminists have a very twisted view of feminism and in a lot of ways a very sexist worldview because first of all thinking that what makes a woman a woman is her vagina is I would argue very reductionist. It's very minimizing of what it means to be a woman. But besides that, we can look at JK Rowling's works to see so many instances of clear internalized sexism. Now, what is internalized sexism? It is pretty much what it sounds like, internalizing the worldview, the sexist stereotypes that patriarchy has imposed on women. So it's very much the not like other girls syndrome. It's thinking you are better or that that women who are not traditionally girly and feminine are somehow superior to those who are. That girly traits and femininity is bad. As someone who has been a huge Harry Potter fan my whole life, who has gone back and reanalyzed the books, recontextualized them just as an adult, just as someone more aware of social issues, just as someone who is more aware of JK Rowling's stance on things, I have gone back and reflected on the books and found a lot of this worldview. And I think there's no better example than the character of Lavender Brown, because she is, I would say, the most traditionally feminine hero we have in the whole series. And it may be surprising to some people for me to call her a hero, but if you look at all of her like stats on paper, she has no reason not to be considered a hero in the same vein as characters such as Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas. And yeah, they're a little more periphery than say like Jenny or Neville, but they're still in the story. They still do good things. They're not evil characters. Like Lavender Brown, she's a Gryffindor, which I'm a Slytherin. Obviously I don't think all Slytherins are evil, but in the worldview of Harry Potter, she's a Gryffindor. She's in Dumbledore's army. She fought against the Death Eaters who took over Hogwarts during the seventh year. Like she was on the good side through and through. She fought in the Battle of Hogwarts. Like she did all these good things. And yet she was very much framed by the narrative in both the books and the movies as this character that we're supposed to dislike. She is the inferior love interest for Ron, not really because of anything she did or even didn't do, but because she's girly. She's the girly option, so she's inferior to Hermione as a love interest. And it would be one thing if Lavender Brown was just one of many traditionally feminine characters in Harry Potter that were shown in different lights, but I would argue that all of the traditionally feminine characters are shown in a negative light or at least have to overcome their femininity in some way to prove themselves to the narrative, prove that they're worthy in a way. And since Lavender Brown never really does that, she is shown negatively throughout the whole story, despite, again, never doing anything really wrong. Because if you look at Harry Potter, who are the most feminine characters, the most traditionally feminine characters? Well, the most traditionally feminine of all is Umbridge. And I don't think I should have to explain why uh, she is not a positive 
role model view of more feminine women. The second one I would argue would be Narcissa Malfoy. She is very much shown as more traditionally feminine. Even though maybe she's not like girly, she is an elegant femininity. She, you know, is about fashion and she always looks put together and she's very happy with her husband and her son and playing that mother role, which Molly Weasley is too, but Narcissa is just shown as a more classically feminine figure than Molly Weasley, I would argue. And I remember distinctly the description of Narcissa Malfoy when she was first introduced in the books was that she looked like her face was permanently stuck in a sneer. It was something about her sneering. And if we look at her arc over the books, she's not a hero. Like she does one good thing. She lies to Voldemort that Harry's dead, but that's not done because she's a good person. It's done because she's a good mother, which I would argue are different traits. I mean, she's not a Death Eater, but she's with the Death Eaters the whole time. She definitely is in the circle. She's in Voldemort's circle, even if she's not directly working for him. Her husband does, her son does, and even though she doesn't like it necessarily, she's not going against it because, oh, I'm morally against what he's doing this for. She's against it because, oh, it puts my loved ones in danger. So I would argue that she's not really a positive view of femininity either. We have Fleur Delacour, which she is the one who has to prove that she's masculine enough. Like she has to overcome her femininity to be accepted by the Weasleys. She's shown as someone who needs saving, who can't complete these tasks in the Triwizard Tournament. When she's married to Bill, they don't really like her. Or is she married to Charlie? I think she's married to Bill. They don't really like her. They see her as too feminine, as someone who can't really be his proper equal until she sort of proves she's not, oh, so vain and shallow that she's just with him for his looks. Like, why does she have to prove that? Why can't she just love him and be feminine? So out of these characters, we're left with Lavender Brown, who we're shown over and over again is the inferior love interest to Hermione. We're not really supposed to like her or relate to her or jive with her. Like, she's not a character we're supposed to really care about, even though, again, she does pretty much everything right. There's a couple little, little things she does wrong throughout the books, but nothing that should put her in this category of the way the narrative frames her as this negative person. But she also never, you know, overcomes that femininity, so she doesn't get the Fleur treatment either. And I know this because I got a PDF of the entire series. Don't worry, I got it ethically. And I control F'd to find every mention of the word lavender in the series. And there was 138 mentions and I read through all of them. There were several that were just like, and she was in class with them and had a reaction to what was going on in class. So I skipped those, but I pulled out basically everything that shows Lavender Brown as a character throughout the series. And we're gonna go through her arc and think of her as the main character and show why there is really no reason that she should have this negative framing. So I'm gonna scooch on over and let's go ahead and dive right in with the first time we meet Lavender Brown in the first book. Brocklehurst Mary went to Ravenclaw too, but Brown, Lavender, became the first new Gryffindor and the table on the far left exploded with cheers. Harry could see Ron's twin brother's catcalling. I'm sorry, he could see them what? I looked up catcalling because I thought there has to be another definition of this word that I'm just not as familiar with, you know? There has to be something. It can't just mean, you know, what I think of as catcalling. But when I looked it up, the only definition I could find was make a whistle, shout, or comment of a sexual nature to a woman passing by. There was nothing else I could find. So the first mention of Lavender Brown in these books as an 11 year old, this is at her sorting, is getting sexually harassed by two of the most beloved characters in this book. I know they're just 12 at that time, but like, what the heck is this? Like you wanna talk about some negative framing? She's just introduced and sexually harassed 
as a child. And this is just passed by. Never comes back, never is questioned. Yeah, I, I was like, I knew this was bad from my memory, but I didn't realize it was that bad. Right, who wants to go first? Most of the class backed further away in answer. Even Harry, Ron, and Hermione had misgivings. The hippogriffs were tossing their fierce heads and flexing their powerful wings. They didn't seem to like being tethered like this. No one, said Hagrid with a pleading look. I'll do it, said Harry. There was an intake of breath from behind him, and both Lavender and Pravati whispered, Oh no, Harry, remember your tea leaves. Harry ignored them. He climbed over the paddock fence. And I wanted to show this because I just want to show the way the narrative itself is very dismissive of her. And in a way, in a lot of this, Parvati as well, because they're best friends. So a lot of these things, they're very just dismissive of both of them. But they are warning Harry, hey, remember that thing that said you're gonna die? Maybe watch out. Maybe remember that. In a way, we could see this as her being a good friend. You know, we could have Harry be like, yeah, but I, d I don't think this is it. Or I d I I'm not gonna put stock in this, but thanks for the warning. Like anything just to acknowledge that in a way she is being kind and caring here instead of just like, oh, Harry ignored them. This isn't worth paying attention to moving on. And there was a lot of times in these books that Lavender would say something and just like be ignored or immediately dismissed by the narrative. And here's another example of that dismissiveness towards Lavender Brown. Talking excitedly, the class left the staff room. Harry, however, wasn't feeling cheerful. Professor Lupin had deliberately stopped him from tackling the boggart. Why? Was it because he'd seen Harry collapse on the train and thought he wasn't up to much? Had he thought Harry would pass out again? but no one else seemed to have noticed anything. Did you see me take that banshee, shouted Seamus? And the hand, said Dean, waving his own around? And Snape in that hat? And my mummy? I wonder why Professor Lupin's frightened of crystal balls, said Lavender thoughtfully. That was the best defense against the dark arts lesson we've ever had, wasn't it? Said Ron excitedly as they made their way back to the classroom to get their bags. He seems like a very good teacher, said Hermione approvingly, but I wish I could have had a turn with the boggart. What would it have been for you, said Ron, sniggering, a piece of homework that only got nine out of 10? Lavender's asking a really important plot question here that none of the main characters caught on to. Like we know as the reader that it's not a crystal ball, it's the full moon and Lupin's afraid of it because he's a werewolf. But this is such a crucial question to the plot that shows she's smart, she's catching things that even our main characters aren't catching and yet, and yet the narrative just keeps going like it's whatever. And I know in a way this is a way to give the readers information without it sticking out as, oh, this is a clue to solve the mystery. But because of the way that she has been dismissed previously in these books, it makes sense that if the crucial information is coming out of her mouth, the reader has been shown not to pay attention to her. Which, why? Why is she the character that we're not supposed to pay attention to? Even though clearly she's smart and aware because she's asking this crucial question. And then next, this one's a big one. And this one I chose as sort of an example to talk about a bigger issue in the framing of Lavender Brown because there was a lot of examples like this but let me read it. Harry was also growing to dread the hours he spent in Professor Trelawney's stifling tower room, deciphering lopsided shapes and symbols, trying to ignore the way Professor Trelawney's enormous eyes filled with tears every time she looked at him. He couldn't like Professor Trelawney even though she was treated with respect, bordering on reverence by many of the class. Pravati Patel and Lavender Brown had taken to haunting Professor Trelawney's tower room at lunchtimes and always returned with annoyingly superior looks on their faces, as though they knew things the others didn't. They had also started using hushed voices whenever they spoke to Harry, as though he were on his deathbed. So a big part of Lavender Brown's character is her reverence for and respect of Professor Trelawney. It's one of the most important relationships we see with her throughout the books. In a way, it's supposed to continue to show us how nonsensical, how frivolous, in a way how stupid she is because she believes in all these things Professor Trelawney is saying when the smart thing, the thing Harry does, the thing Hermione does, the thing Dumbledore does is be dismissive of Trelawney. But I'm very confused by this because the entire point of Trelawney's character is that she is always correct. If you go through these books, every single one of her predictions is correct, not just the prophecy, but even the little things. Even when she says something about Harry being born in winter and he was born in July, well, he has a piece of Voldemort's soul in him and Voldemort was born in winter. Like they're always 
correct. Because she's a descendant of Cassandra, who was a mythological figure who was cursed to know the future, but no one would ever believe her. So she has that curse on her that no one ever believes her, but she's right. So if anything, this is proving that Lavender Brown and Pravati Patel are really smart to trust her, to know that what she's saying is correct. Because like the thing about all the people dying young, they were all the people that died in the Battle of Hogwarts. Harry did die young. Like the whole point of Trelawney is that she's right. Lavender was right to trust her. And it's really shown over and over again to be this frivolous thing. And I guess you could argue that well, Harry is the point of view character, and if the point of Trelawney is she's always right but no one trusts her, then it makes sense for him not to trust her. But why is this constantly used to look down on Lavender Brown? Like, it really feels like those dudes who just act so superior because they don't believe in astrology. And like whenever a girl has an interest in astrology, they act like she's so stupid and whatever, and then they'll go and buy fucking crypto. And you're like, why do you have to be rude to her interests? Yet, yeah. And then we get a really good example of this and the difference between Lavender and Hermione because Lavender versus Hermione is a very big aspect of Lavender Brown's character in these books. Lavender Brown seemed to be crying. Pavati had her arm around her and was explaining something to Seamus Finnegan and Dean Thomas who were looking very serious. What's the matter, Lavender? said Hermione anxiously as she, Harry, and Ron went to join the group. She got a letter from home this morning, Pravati whispered. It's her rabbit, Binky. He's been killed by a fox. Oh, said Hermione. I'm so sorry, Lavender. I should have known, said Lavender tragically. You know what day it is? Er, the 16th of October. That thing you're dreading, it will happen on the 16th of October. Remember? She was right. She was right. The whole class was gathered around Lavender now. Seamus shook his head seriously. Hermione hesitated. Then she said, you, you were dreading Binky being killed by a fox? Well, not necessarily by a fox, said Lavender, looking up at Hermione with streaming eyes, but I was obviously dreading him dying, wasn't I? Oh, said Hermione. She paused again. Then, was Binky an old rabbit? N no, sobbed Lavender. He, he was only a baby. Pravati tightened her arm around Lavender's shoulders. But then, why would you dread him dying, said Hermione. Pravati glared at her. Well, look at it logically, said Hermione, turning to the rest of the group. I mean, Binky didn't even die today, did he? Lavender just got the news today, Lavender wailed loudly. And she can't have been dreading it because it's come as a real shock. Don't mind Hermione, Lavender, said Ron loudly. She doesn't think other people's pets matter very much. Imagine you've just lost a beloved pet and someone comes to comfort you. And then they're like, oh, you're stupid for believing in the person who told you something bad would happen today. You're not being logical about this. And you're like, I'm just crying, trying to like mourn the death of my pet. And you want to be questioning my favorite teacher right now? Like, that's so shitty of Hermione. And when you compare these two characters, like the narrative does over and over again and shows Hermione as like the more logical choice, like the better choice, She's not in this case. Like she's not being empathetic or caring. I mean, she kind of is at first and then she turns it to, well, you're stupid because you believed someone who told you something bad would happen today. And we're supposed to agree with Hermione. We as the reader are supposed to agree with Hermione that Lavender is being like stupid about this or Lavender is being over the top or dramatic about this. What? Like imagine you're mourning your pet and this happens. Okay, next we have one of the only two bad things Lavender Brown has done in these books. So here's a bad thing she's done. How are you supposed to defend yourself against something you've never seen? A wizard who's about to put an illegal curse on you isn't going to tell you what he's about to do. He's not going to do it nice and polite to your face. You need to be prepared. You need to be alert and watchful. You need to put that away, Miss Brown, when I'm talking. Lavender jumped and blushed. She had been showing Pavati her completed horoscope under the desk. Apparently Moody's magical eye could see through solid wood as well as out of the back of his head. She was doing something she wasn't supposed to be in class. Like that is literally the level I had to go to to find something bad this girl did throughout the entire series. Ooh. There's another one that I would say is worse, but literally two. 
and this is one of them. Now the ball will be open only to fourth years and above, although you may invite a younger student if you wish. Lavender Brown let out a shrill giggle. Pavati Patel nudged her hard in the ribs, her face working furiously as she too fought not to giggle. They both looked around at Harry. Professor McGonagall ignored them, which Harry thought was distinctly unfair as she had just told off him and Ron. Why I picked this out is because of the descriptive shrill. It's a negative connotation describing the giggle and she giggles a lot. It got to the point where I was like, can you find another word, please, JK Rowling, like to describe what this girl is doing? Like you can't say laughed, it always has to be giggle. The more feminine, the more typically looked down upon word, which I would say, you know what, if we're trying to argue that traditionally feminine things aren't inherently bad, giggling isn't bad, but a shrill giggle. Again, it's just one of those little things that frame this character as negative when she really doesn't do anything wrong. And it's specifically negative in a feminine way. Luna drifted away from them at the Ravenclaw table. The moment they reached Gryffindors, Ginny was hailed by some fellow fourth years and left to sit with them. Harry, Ron, Hermione, and Neville found seats together about halfway down the table between nearly headless Nick, the Gryffindor house ghost, and Pavati Patel and Lavender Brown, the last two of whom gave Harry overly friendly greetings that made him quite sure they had stopped talking about him a split second before. How do you know? How do you know they were doing that? Why? Like, why is that the detail given about these characters? Our main character doesn't even know that for sure. And yes, you could say, you know, maybe he's just being paranoid, but it's just weird to constantly have this inference by the writer that these two feminine characters are doing something wrong. I know that I originally started this video, like, specifically about Lavender Brown, but now I'm getting irked on Pavati Patel's behalf as well. Like, they're just feminine girls. They could just be being friendly. Like, why does this have to be framed as, oh, they were clearly gossiping about him? That's what's going on here. And I'm sure it was because that's clearly what JK Rowling thinks of really feminine girls. Seamus reckons Harry's lying about you know who, said Ron succinctly when Harry did not respond. Hermione, whom Harry had expected to react angrily on his behalf, sighed. Yes, Lavender thinks so too, she said gloomily. Been having a nice little chat with her about whether or not I'm lying, attention-seeking prat, have you, said Harry loudly. No, said Hermione calmly. I told her, no, I said forcefully, said Hermione calmly. No, said Hermione calmly. I told her to keep her big fat mouth shut about you actually. And it would be quite nice if you stopped jumping down Ron's and my throats, Harry, because if you haven't noticed, we're on your side. I don't know, again, this just felt weird. This just felt like, why did it have to be Lavender? Why couldn't it have been someone else? Why is she the one that's talking negatively, that assumes the worst? And I know this is kind of more of a flimsy example in a way, but I just think it's all of it together. It's always her. She's always seen as this frivolous, dismissible, gossipy character. And like, I guess she is those things because that's the author's choice to make her that way. But why does the really feminine girl have to also have all of these negative traits constantly associated with hyperfemininity as well? And it's like, of course it's Lavender who doubts Harry because it couldn't be a Hermione. It couldn't be a Ginny. It couldn't be a Luna. The next one is another great example of like Lavender versus Hermione. Ooh, said Pravati and Lavender, thoroughly irritating Harry. Anyone would have thought that Hagrid never showed them impressive creatures. Admittedly, the Flober worms have, okay, I'm skipping past. So anyone know the names of these creatures, Miss Granger? Bow truckles, said Hermione. They're tree guardians, usually live in wand trees. So you see the difference in reaction. Pravati and Lavender, they irritate Harry by being excited about these creatures, whereas Hermione has the proper response. She gives information about them because she is smart and she is not girly and she is not excited by these cute tree creatures. You see the difference? Because Hermione doesn't have the girly reaction and Pravati and Lavender don't have the smart reaction. What if they knew? <laughs> what if they knew the answer to this too? Okay, and then next we have the one truly negative thing that Lavender Brown does in this entire series. I'm not saying this is good. This is genuinely not a good thing to do, but it's the one in this whole series. Er, right, said Harry awkwardly. Luna was wearing what looked like a pair of orange radish earrings, a fact that Pravati and Lavender seemed to have noticed as they were both giggling and pointing at her earlobes. You can laugh, Luna said, her voice rising, apparently under the impression that Pravati and Lavender were laughing at what she had said rather than what she was wearing. But people used to believe there were no such things as the bibbling hum humdinger or the crumplehorn snorkack. Well, they were right, weren't they? said Hermione impatiently. 
there weren't any such things as the blibbering hummed or the crumple horn snorkak. Luna gave her a withering look and flounced away, radishes swinging madly. Bravati and Lavender were not the only ones hooting with laughter now. That's it this one instance. This is the worst thing I found that she did in this entire book series. So yes, Lavender Brown makes fun of Luna Lovegood. That's not a good thing. We shouldn't bully each other. But it's literally not worse than any of our main characters who, it says, were hooting with laughter now. It's just in the leniency and forgiveness other characters get that she doesn't. And I'm not saying that I want Lavender to be like this flawless person who never does anything wrong. In fact, I'm glad we see her do something wrong because Real people have flaws. Real people are mean to others. Real people do bad things. But I'm just saying in comparison to the way the narrative treats her, when you look at her actual actions that are negative, it doesn't even out. It doesn't make sense. She is treated worse, like she is a worse person than we see her being in the narrative. And it really seems to come down to just she's more girly and that should be punished. Because she's more girly, she is inherently inferior to characters like Hermione and Ginny. And especially coming up, you'll see she really is positioned as this adversary to Hermione, and she's positioned as the obviously lesser choice. And next we have Lavender doing a good thing. There was a gentle knock at the door. Harry looked around. Ginny, Neville, Lavender, Pravati, and Dean had arrived. Whoa, said Dean, staring around impressed. What is this place? Harry began to explain, but before he had finished, more people had arrived, and he had to start all over again. By the time eight o'clock arrived, every cushion was occupied. So I'm gonna stop there, but this is the first meeting of the DA, Dumbledore's army. And Lavender is one of the first characters there. Look at who she is placed with. She's with Harry, Ron, and Hermione, Ginny, Neville, Pravati, and Dean. So we have literally hero characters. Ginny and Neville are both part of the silver trio. We have our golden trio. Like she is one of the first people there. Both her and Pravati are some of the first people to come to the first DA meeting. She's one of the hero characters, man. That's what I'm saying. And narratively, she is not treated as such. Not really, said Hermione indifferently, who was reading the Daily Prophet. I've never really liked horses. She turned a page of the newspaper, scanning its columns. He's not a horse. He's a centaur, said Lavender, sounding shocked. A gorgeous centaur, sighed Pravati. Either way, he's still got four legs, said Hermione coolly. Anyway, I thought you two were all upset that Trelawney had gone. We are, Lavender assured her. We went up to her office to see her. We took her some daffodils. Not the honking ones that Sprouts got. Nice ones. So two things. First of all, Lavender is caring. She goes to check on Trelawney after Umbridge fired her. Like, she does this good thing for someone she cares about. But second of all, can we talk about Hermione's racism in this passage because a theme introduced by J.K. Rowling in these books is the way that non-wizard magical creatures are treated as less than by the wizards. It's a reoccurring theme. I'll link a video that discusses it down in the description, but it is a reoccurring theme that magical creatures who are not wizards are treated as less than. They're not allowed wands and some other things, and one of the ways Voldemort recruits these creatures is to basically be like, I'll treat you better than the treatment you're getting now. And centaurs are one of these creatures who are seen as less than and in a way is an allegory for racism in these books. And Hermione here is literally calling one of them an animal. And, and she's our character, like main female strong character we're supposed to be rooting for. And like the casual racism, there's a lot of racism allegories in these books with Muggleborns and all of that. But, like this is one of them and J.K. Rowling has a problem with introducing themes in her books that she doesn't really know how to handle well. Because Hermione, I would say, is one of the most beloved characters in these books. And yet we have scenes like this, which are never dealt with, are never treated with the gravitas they should be for a racism allegory. So we have these two characters that are pitted against each other, clearly coming up, and we're supposed to root for Hermione, yet in this passage we see Lavender being kind and caring and Hermione being racist. 
So the next few kind of go together. So Hermione's remonstration was drowned by a loud giggle. Lavender Brown had apparently found Ron's remark highly amusing. She continued to laugh as she passed them, glancing back at Ron over her shoulder. Ron looked rather pleased with himself. When they left the Gryffindor table five minutes later to head down to the Quidditch pitch, they passed Lavender Brown and Pavati Patel. Remembering what Hermione had said about the Patel twins' parents wanting them to leave Hogwarts, Harry was unsurprised to see that the two best friends were whispering together, looking distressed. What did surprise him was that when Ron drew level with them, Pravati suddenly nudged Lavender who looked around and gave Ron a wide smile. Ron blinked at her, then returned the smile uncertainly. And then we have another one. Ron looked ready to pass out as he mounted his clean sweep 11. Good luck, cried a voice from the stands. Harry looked around, expecting to see Hermione, but it was Lavender Brown. So clearly, Lavender has a crush on Ron. We see her flirting with him, smiling at him, showing interest. She's showing interest in him in, I would say, a very normal way. So that's just what I wanted to establish with those passages. The Gryffindor table, a solid mass of red and gold, cheered as Harry and Ron approached. Harry grinned and waved. Ron grimanced weakly and shook his head. Cheer up, Ron, called Lavender. I know you'll be brilliant. Ron ignored her. And he just goes on and doesn't talk to her and just dismisses her. Okay, okay. This is gonna be his girlfriend soon. In fact, the next thing is that scene. Looking for Ron, she asked, smirking. He's over there, the filthy hypocrite. Harry looked into the corner she was indicating. There, in full view of the whole room, stood Ron wrapped so closely around Lavender Brown it was hard to tell whose hands were whose. It looks like he's eating her face, doesn't it? Said Jenny dispassionately. But I suppose he's got to refine his technique somehow. Good game, Harry. And then a little bit later in the same scene. The door behind them burst open. To Harry's horror, Ron came in, laughing, pulling Lavender by the hand. Oh, he said, drawing up short at the sight of Harry and Hermione. Oops, said Lavender, and she backed out of the room, giggling. Again with the giggling. The door swung shut behind her. There was a horrible, swelling, billowing silence. Hermione was staring at Ron, who refused to look at her, but said with an odd mixture of bravado and awkwardness, Hi, Harry. Wondered where you'd got to. Hermione slid off the desk. The little flock of golden birds continued to twitter in circles around her head so that she looked like a strange, feathery model of the solar system. You shouldn't leave Lavender waiting outside, she said quietly. She'll wonder where you've gone. She walked very slowly and erectly toward the door. Harry glanced at Ron, who was looking relieved that nothing worse had happened. A pug no, came a shriek from the doorway. Harry spun around to see Hermione pointing her wand at Ron. Her expression wild. The little flock of birds was speeding like a hail of fat golden bullets towards Ron, who yelped and covered his face with his hands. But the birds attacked, pecking and clawing at every bit of flesh they could reach. Get her off me, he yelled. But with one last look of vindictive fury, Hermione wrenched open the door and disappeared through it. Harry thought he heard a sob before it slammed. Okay. So, we have... Lavender Brown, who had a crush on this boy, was ignored by him, but she was flirting with him, she had a crush, they get together. And then we have Hermione, who also had a crush, who did nothing to indicate towards Ron, to tell him, I have feelings for you, getting angry and jealous and attacking him. Because he got with a different girl who actually showed interest in him. And we're supposed to think Hermione is the right love interest? Like, I don't want this video to come across as, oh, I'm just attacking Hermione. Hermione's horrible because she's not. I love Hermione. She's a great character. But in the specific instance where we're comparing these two, like the book does, and the book is framing Hermione as the obvious choice, the one we're supposed to be rooting for, I have to question that because her actions aren't proving that. Like, she's just being really jealous and, like, physically attacked him, like, with magic. But, like, he is getting injured because she is jealous that he went for the girl that was showing interest in him. And it feels, in a way, like Ron is being punished by not going for the girl who approached it correctly who like had the right kind of crush or like handled her crush in the right way. He went for the girl that was showing interest. Ron, who might once have found the necessity of these detours a cause for jealousy rather than hilarity, simply roared with laughter about it all. Although Harry much preferred this new laughing, joking Ron to the moody, aggressive model he had been previously enduring for the last few weeks, the improved Ron came at a heavy price. Firstly, Harry had to put up with the frequent presence of Lavender Brown, who seemed to regard any moment that she was not kissing Ron as a moment wasted. And secondly, Harry found himself once more the best friend of two people who seemed unlikely to ever speak to each other again. Why is she 
first. Like, why is she the more horrible thing to have to put up with? Like, oh no, she likes her boyfriend and wants to make out a lot with him. Like, okay, yeah, that's kind of annoying, but like, that's the heavy price for your best friend being happy. Okay, okay. It's again, framing her as somehow the villain of this situation. She's got to be joking. Harry woke with a start to find a bulging stocking laying over the end of his bed. He put on his glasses and looked around. The tiny window was almost completely obscured with snow and in front of it, Ron was sitting bolt upright in bed and examining what appeared to be a thick gold chain. What's that? asked Harry. It's from Lavender, said Ron, sounding revolted. She can't honestly think I'd wear. Harry looked more closely and let out a shout of laughter. Dangling from the chain in large gold letters were the words, my sweetheart. Nice, he said. Classy. You should definitely wear it in front of Fred and George. She got him a cringy Christmas gift. That's why she's a terrible girlfriend, because she got him a bad Christmas gift. And like, I can also see why someone who very much knows that another girl that he was best friends with, who's into him, like, that this is going on, why she would get him something that would kind of publicly claim him as hers. It's obviously not a good gift, but like, is it really that bad? Is it really that terrible? Is it really a reason that she is the problem in this when the real problem is just he can't like admit to himself that he wants to date Hermione and like, like he is the one doing wrong here. But at that moment, there was a loud squeal of Juan Juan and Lavender Brown came hurling out of nowhere and flung herself into Ron's arms. Several onlookers sniggered. Hermione gave a tinkling laugh and said, there's a table over here, coming Jenny? Like again, just like, why are people making fun of her for this? All she is is into her boyfriend. Who gives a shit? Why, oh, why is this just so mean to her for no fucking reason? And it's trying to make her like really annoying, but it's like, she cares about her boyfriend. What did she do that's so bad? If he doesn't like the nickname or if he doesn't like her being that public, why can't he just tell her? Like, wh why Why can't he have a conversation? She's just being affectionate, I don't know. Lavender was waiting beside the portrait hole, a complication Harry had not foreseen. You're late, Juan Juan, she pouted. I've got you a birthday, leave me alone, said Ron impatiently. Harry's going to introduce me to Romil Devane. And without another word to her, he pushed his way out of the portrait hole. Harry tried to make an apologetic face to Lavender, but it might have turned out simply amused because she looked more offended than ever as the fat lady swung shut behind them. Yeah! Imagine you are waiting for your boyfriend. He is late. You have a birthday present for him. And he's just like, get out of my way. Harry is going to introduce me to another woman. And it's, it's, it's funny, she, she is somehow like, oh, we should laugh at her because she's upset about this and she's kind of, she, she's too into her boyfriend. What? I would be pissed. Meanwhile, Lavender kept sliding up to Harry to discuss Ron, which Harry found almost more wearing than McLagan's Quidditch lectures. At first, Lavender had been very annoyed that nobody had thought to tell her that Ron was in the hospital wing. I mean, I am his girlfriend. I mean, yeah, if my boyfriend was in the hospital and no one told me, I would also be upset. But apparently she's annoying for this. How dare she care about her boyfriend? But unfortunately, she had now decided to forgive Harry this lapse of memory and was keen to have lots of in-depth chats with him about Ron's feelings, a most uncomfortable experience that Harry would have happily forgone. Look, why don't you talk to Ron about this? Harry asked after a particularly long interrogation from Lavender that took in everything from precisely what Ron had said about her new dress robes to whether or not Harry thought that Ron considered his relationship with Lavender to be serious. Well, I would, but he's always asleep when I go and see him, said Lavender fretfully. Is he, said Harry, surprised, for he had found Ron perfectly alert every time he had been up to the hospital wing, both highly interested in the news of Dumbledore and Snape's row and keen to abuse McLagan as much as possible. Is Hermione Granger still visiting him? Lavender demanded suddenly. Yeah, I think so. Well, they're friends, aren't they? said Harry uncomfortably. Friends, don't make me laugh, said Lavender scornfully. She didn't talk to him for weeks after he started going out with me, but I suppose she wants to make up with him now he's all interesting. Would you call getting poisoned interesting, asked Harry. Anyway, sorry, got to go. There's McLagan coming for a talk about Quidditch, said Harry hurriedly, and he dashed sideways through a door pretending to be a solid wall. Okay, anyway. I mean, yeah, I would also be talking to my boyfriend's best friend asking, hey, do you think he thinks our relationship is serious? If he's pretending to be asleep every time I go to the hospital to talk to him, if he's spending time with another girl that I know likes him, like, okay, maybe she shouldn't ask him all the time, but being a little overzealous about 
finding out this information. Clearly she just, she just cares about her boyfriend. It literally just shows she cares about her boyfriend. You know, she's grown on me, Luna, he said as they set off again for the Great Hall. I know she's insane, but it's in a good, he stopped talking very suddenly. Lavender Brown was standing at the foot of the marble staircase looking thunderous. Hi, said Ron nervously. Come on, Harry muttered to Hermione, and they sped past, though not before they heard Lavender say, why didn't you tell me you were getting out today? And why was she with you? Ron looked both sulky and annoyed when he appeared at breakfast half an hour later, and though he sat with Lavender, Harry did not see them exchange a word all the time they were together. Hermione was acting as though she was quite oblivious to all of this, but once or twice Harry saw an inexplicable smirk cross her face. All that day she seemed to be in a particularly good mood, and that evening in the common room she even consented to look over, in other words, finish writing, Harry's Herbology essay, something she had been resolutely refusing to do up to this point because she had known that Harry would then let Ron copy his work. Again, if my boyfriend didn't tell me he was in the hospital when he was getting out of the hospital, I feel like that is a perfectly reasonable thing to get upset over, especially if the girl who's into him, who is basically straight up trying to steal my boyfriend, is all happy about it. This all makes perfectly logical sense. This is all a very logical reaction to if this was happening, especially if she cares so deeply about him, which she has shown over and over again. How is she the villain here? Hermione is literally just straight up trying to steal her boyfriend. You shouldn't do that. If you were into someone and they have a girlfriend or a significant other, they are off the table. You stop. I love you, Hermione, said Ron, sinking back in his chair, rubbing his eyes wearily. Hermione turned faintly pink, but merely said, don't let Lavender hear you say that. I won't, said Ron into his hands, or maybe I will. Then she'll ditch me. Why don't you ditch her if you want to finish it? Asked Harry. You haven't ever chucked anyone, have you? Said Ron. You and Cho just sort of fell apart. Yeah, said Harry. Wish that would happen with me and Lavender, said Ron gloomily, watching Hermione silently tapping each of his misspelled words with the end of her wand so that they corrected themselves on the page. But the more I hint I want to finish it, the tighter she holds on. It's like going out with the giant squid. Just tell her. What I'm hearing is you're stringing this girl along by not just telling her it's over. And you're blaming her for it. She is the one that is getting blamed for Ron's inability to communicate here. Like she is the problem because she's trying to hold on to her relationship with her boyfriend that she cares about. He pulled the invisibility cloak over his head and set off down the stairs, Ron and Hermione hurrying along behind him. At the foot of the stairs, Harry slid through the open door. What were you doing up there with her? Shrieked Lavender Brown, staring right through Harry at Ron and Hermione emerging together from the boys' dormitories. Harry heard Ron sputtering behind him as he darted across the room away from them. Yeah, if I know this girl is trying to steal my boyfriend and I see them coming from a like private place alone, I would also be upset. He brushed some of the fake snow off Hermione's shoulder. Lavender burst into tears. Ron looked immensely guilty and turned his back on her. We split up, he told Harry out of the corner of his mouth. Last night, when she saw me coming out of the dormitory with Hermione, obviously she couldn't see you, so she thought it had just been the two of us. Ah, said Harry. Well, you don't mind it's over, do you? No, admitted Ron. It was pretty bad while she was yelling, but at least I didn't have to finish it. Coward, said Hermione, though she looked amused. Well, it was a bad night for romance all around. Ginny and Dean split up too, Harry. And we're supposed to see this as a good thing. And in a way, I suppose it is because, you know, Ron wasn't happy with the relationship, so he should end it in order to not string Lavender along anymore. But it's still framed as if this is somehow Lavender's fault for being this crazy girlfriend. She was just so annoying and over the top, even though it all came from, oh, she cares about him so much. And he could have always told her that the way she was expressing that emotion made him uncomfortable. He could have had a conversation with her. But it really feels like J.K. Rowling just wanted it to be clear that she's too girly. So she is obviously the inferior choice of girlfriend. She's obviously just going to be this really annoying, over-the-top, needy girlfriend. The only way to right this situation is for him to leave her and be with Hermione who is the better choice because she won't have those annoying traits that come from just being girly and being into her boyfriend too much. So then after all of that, that is the main character arc, the main plot Lavender Brown gets. And the last, the very last mention of Lavender Brown in the whole series is this. No, shrieked Hermione with a deafening blast from her wand. Fenair Greyback was thrown backwards from the feebly stirring body of Lavender Brown. He hit the marble banisters and struggled to return to his feet. Then with a bright white flash and a crack, a crystal ball fell on top of his head and he crumpled to the ground and did not move.
Okay, my battery died, so I had to plug it in for a while. So if the screen suddenly shifted a little bit, that's what happened. But anyway, the last thing we see of Lavender Brown is Hermione saving her. It's kind of unclear if she lived or not in the movies. I think she definitely was like shown as dead, but she doesn't even get like a final, she saved somebody. She did a really cool uh, magic thing and she took down a Death Eater. Like she doesn't even get a final triumphant moment. She is just the damsel in distress that the girl who literally stole her boyfriend had to save her. At least Trelawney helped. Really, I think the message here is pretty clear. It's saying, be a Hermione, don't be a Lavender. That girls like Hermione are smart and capable and girls like Lavender will just always need saving. It's really equating Lavender's femininity with a helplessness, with being annoying with being oh no just too into your boyfriend which that's just gonna lose you the guy anyway because guys don't like that and that is all a very sexist attitude like seriously the insult to have Hermione be the one to save Lavender after everything Lavender Brown should have saved herself but it just kind of feels like really her story started being sexually harassed and ended as the damsel in distress even though throughout the whole book, she did very few things wrong. And it just felt like she was really punished by the narrative for being this girly person. It just reeks of internalized sexism. It just reeks of this character was always given the short end of the stick because, hey, she's the girly one. So she has every negative girly trait associated with her. She's constantly giggling. She's shrill. She's just into her boyfriend. She's just boy crazy. She's, you know, into divination. And that's like not a serious magic like the stuff Hermione studies. Even though again, Trelawney was always right. And it's like, I get it. I very much used to be one of those not like other girls. I didn't like makeup and girly things. But you know, I was a teenager and I grew out of it. And I just feel like JK Rowling never did. Because Hermione really does feel like her self-insert character. It feels like Hermione is who she thinks she is, or at least wishes she was. And then she puts Hermione in competition with Lavender, a very girly girl, and Lavender is just the villain of the story the whole time, even if you really analyze it. It's kind of Hermione who's the villain in that situation. She's the one actively trying to steal another girl's boyfriend. What I'm saying is, you can be a Hermione, you can be a Jenny or a Luna or a Molly Weasley, but you can be a Lavender Brown too, and that's okay. So with that, that's kind of all I have to say. That's why I wanted to make this video in defense of Lavender Brown. I think she was given the short end of the stick by the narrative and is not appreciated enough among the Harry Potter fandom. So that's why I personally am kind of reclaiming this character and being like, she is now my like personal, I am like other girls and that's fabulous owning my femininity type of character. I have a couple of pins that are of Lavender Brown and I'm very excited to grow my Lavender Brown pin collection. Let me grab them real quick. So I have these two and I love them. There's not a lot of Lavender Brown pins and I think that's a shame because she's fabulous and I think she deserves more love. Anyway, thank you all so, so much for watching. Like I said at the beginning, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe and comment and do all those youtube -y things. It really does help my channel. And with that, I will see you all next time. Was I a little too on the nose with the lavender eyeshadow for lavender brown? But it's also a girly color and I like it.